So now, ladies and gentlemen, live and in colour, it's Mr. Wayne Lovejuice. The other day I produced a movie Had a cat with an interesting trappy We said that the YouTube algorithm Really out that happy If a channel only broadcasts once a week So we decided we could text ya Whenever we've got a piece of news In our new book on the track extra Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special treat for you on On The Track Extra this week. But first, I hear you say, what's On The Track Extra? Well, if you don't know that, you probably shouldn't be watching the show. But my name is John Downs. I'm the director of an organisation called the Centre for Fortune Zoology, which is, as far as we're aware, the largest, and we'd like to think the best, mystery animal research group in the English-speaking world. Every Saturday afternoon at three o'clock for about half an hour and every Wednesday evening at 6.30 at about half that we bring you a melange, if you will, of melange, a mysterious melange, a... I can't think of things beginning with M. A manky, mysterious melange of hard science, weird shit, and surreality. What's surreality, I hear you ask? Well, this is. I've told you about and introduced you to my old friend Richard Muirhead on many occasions. He's actually the person I've known longest in the world who's still alive, apart from my brother and my cousin Penny. Apart from that, everybody else I know who I knew from back in the 60s has long since either disappeared from my life or disappeared from the world. Richard Muirhead, amongst other things, is probably the best researcher I know. He's a bit like one of those truffle hounds that you let go in a French woodland and he goes snuffling around in the uh, roots of oak trees and comes back with immensely valuable lumps of fungus. Well, if you um, substitute the word truffle hound for nice scholarly gentleman in middle age, and substitute mm -hmm. the word lump of fungus for interesting information in libraries that just about tells you all you need to know about Richard. But just in case you wonder who he is, say hello to everyone. Hello. Hello, people. And what we're going to do today is to have a look at the new issue of Richard's magazine, Flying Snake which is something I always look forward to receiving. I have to admit, these days I prefer Flying Snake to Fortean Times or any of the other magazines in the annals of Fortean literature, because this is probably the most eccentric, certainly the most diverse, and the one that makes me laugh more than anybody else. So, we start off, I open it, and immediately it has a clip about a of 34 species of butterflies found in a South Downs National Park, which is always interesting. I wasn't expecting it to be in there, but it is. So first of all, we have Dr. Devo's diary. And if you, if you don't know, Devo are a peculiar post-punk band from Akron, Ohio, who wore peculiar hats. 
Bates. Richard is completely obsessed with them, and one year at the weird weekend, I bought him one of the aforementioned peculiar hats. Have a look. He doesn't. He look magnificent in it. Right. <laughs> let's have a look and see what is in that Doctor Devo's diary, in which he, right at the beginning. He talks about the largest ever hunt of the Loch Ness Monster and the fact that in this magazine, in this issue anyway, is being skewed towards um, cryptozoology and away, away from some of the other peculiar um, creatures which creatures and stories which usually um, populate these pages. Now, it's quite interesting, he's talking about the way that the black-necked ibis can prey on cane toads, which are an introduced species from South and Central America, which have been introduced to Australia and which cause no, no end of trouble there because they are very 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 successful invasive species but these black necked black necked ibises have discovered a way of sidestepping the cane toads hitherto unassailable defense mechanism these ibises have been seen throwing toads in the air which distresses them well it, it distressed me i think i can quite i've got a bit of sympathy with those toads Afterwards, the ibises wipe the toads. The toads, while they're distressed, empty their skin glands, toxic secretion. They wipe then the ibises after throwing them in the air, wipe the toads on wet grass or rinse in the water source, washing off the poison, and then they repeat the entire process until the toads' glands and skin are eventually drained of toxin. After which, the ibises a tasty and restorative meal. This is part of an article on giant toads by Dr. Carl Schuker, who is an old friend of us all. And I think it's a very interesting article because he talks about various creatures from all over the world. There's a lot from South America and different places where people claim that there are three or four foot long toads, sometimes which are dangerous to people. This is really interesting stuff. I'd never heard of this before, Richard, did you? No, I only came across it when I looked into that issue of the Shooker Nature blog. It's absolutely fantastic because there's giant frogs. We know that the Goliath frog, yeah, in, um, West Africa. But toads are much more adaptable than frogs, and it actually makes perfect sense that there would be giant toads. And there's a case in China as well. Yes, and of course there was the one you found, which was uh, the toad monster in a place called Devil's Arse. Oh yes, in, yeah. Uh, where yeah. was that? It's in uh, Derbyshire, Derbyshire, yeah. Right? It's a cave system near, in Derbyshire, yeah. Well, it's a wonderful name. That had a long tail though, that particular toad, if it was a toad. I've never heard of any of the Anura having um, long tails, but it's a fantastic story, the fact that it took place in a place called Devil's ass only makes it e even more impressive. I think that vent is now a music venue or a some sort of entertainment venue now. It makes me want to start a band called the Giant Toads. And go and <laughs> from outer space, there. no less. Oh yeah, well they are amphibians from outer space, aren't they? Yeah. And then go and sing a song called "I'm coming from the Devil's ass, Devil's ass, Devil's ass, coming from the Devil's ass." But I'm glad being stupid. So let's go on to Lois Moderman, who's one of my favourite authors in Flying Snake and yeah. indeed in 
Um, but we we publish on Animals and Men. And yeah, she's a regular contributor to uh, Flag Snake. Yeah, and she's, she's a written, Dutch lady. She's written a lovely article here about the gin. Yes, that is interesting. Tell me about gins, because uh, most people only know gins. Uh, most people from a Judeo Judeo Christian background only know about gins from the genies in Aladdin's lamp. Or well, jinns are allegedly some sort of spirit, uh, some sort of uh, rather unpleasant entity. Um, that I think the article there describes them as being made of smokeless fire, whatever that is. Yeah, apparently Muhammad claimed that. Angels are made of light, people Ye are made of clay, and the jinn are made of smokeless fire. Yes. And their race is much older than children. Much older than children, go back. This race is much older than humans, but their lives have much in common with the lives of people. They live in tribes, have families, are born and die, make war with one another, exercise free will, and have very distinct characters. It's like they have a parallel, uh, a parallel culture, a parallel existence uh, alongside the human race, but presumably they're mostly invisible. I've never seen a photo or a drawing of one. So when did you first meet Lois? Because she's an absolute poppet. I've never met her. her. Uh, I think. My friend Bob Skinner got in touch with her on Facebook and that was about 10 years ago and then she became a friend of mine and uh, she's been contributing to Flying Snake for a, a couple of years now. I first met her, well I say met because I've never met her physically, but at least 20 years ago, because I, I was still living in Exeter, when she wrote to talk to us, talk to me, about one of the projects we were doing at the time, trying to find hair samples from an Asian golden cat. And yeah. she was going around all the zoos trying to beg a hair sample, because we brought back some hair from um, Sumatra, and Richard Freeman was had high hopes that it was going to be something called the Chigao, which is mm. a tailless, uh, scimitar-toothed felid that's unknown to science. And we had the hair sample, and Lars Thomas in Copenhagen wanted to compare it with hair samples from a bona fide Asian golden cat, and we couldn't find any, so we set um, Lois onto it, and she did find it in the end. I'm she's very fond of Lois, she's a sweetie. She's, now, written, uh, she's written for Flying Snake about the Mandela effect, which is when, uh, I don't know why it's called the Mandela effect, but it's when you're convinced you've seen a situation happen but then it's impossible to trace exactly why you saw it or when you saw it. It's called that because apparently before he was released in 1990, I think it was, mm. back in the late 70s and 80s when Nelson Mandela was still a prisoner in South Africa, Yeah. lots of people around the world claimed to have remembered seeing his funeral. Because he right. actually died, um, there was no funeral. But that's just one of those weird things mm. that happens in fortune research. And she's written for uh, the yearbook of Animals and Men on black dogs in Holland, I think. Yeah, she's written all sorts of things for us. We now move on to another one of my favourite European authors. Ulrich Nagin, who talks about monsters in Lake Garda in Italy and tells the story of his research 
and goes back along what is these days called a backstory of the monster to tell us all about why people still believe that there's a monster there. Is this one you'd heard of before? No, I hadn't. Ulrich is very good at going through old newspaper archives of uh, continental, continental Europe, particularly German newspapers and Italian newspapers, going back a long way, unearthing all sorts of reports. He also writes a column in 14 times, which I think is called Strange Continent. Well, it's and he's a regular contributor to Flying Snake. Well, it's a good job it's not saying in the continent or in continent. I think <laughs> the strange continent is much better. Yeah. Now we have the story. <laughs> you are kidding. The story of a cat that ate Thomas Hardy's heart. I yes. love this stuff. I was in Salisbury in June this year, beginning of June, with family commemorating 30 years since my father's passing away and we happened to be in Salisbury marketplace on Saturday morning and there was a stall selling all sorts of ephemera including I think it's called the Wessex Journal which had that article in it a rather gruesome story apparently true of just after Thomas Hardy, the novelist, died, a cat stole into the room where he was lying in rest and literally ate his heart. <laughs> very, very gruesome story. <laughs> I don't know how you get these things, Richard. Well, it's serendipity, really. Well, it ties in, actually, with the next story, because the next story is the second part of your article you wrote with Shane Lee yes. on Mystery Giant Salamanders of the World, part yes. two. And I'm part of this in a way because I was in Salisbury yeah. 50 years ago, 1971, so yeah. 51 years ago, and I bought a book called The Zoo and Aquarium Book by E.G. Boulanger. Yeah which has been an absolute godsend to me on and off ever since. My father said, why have you just gone and, waste, why have you just gone and wasted your pocket money on this? I said, because I wanted it, Dad, and I've still got it now, and it's a wonderful book. In it, it talked about there being a second species of Chinese giant salamander, one which was named after the Earl of Sligo, 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 I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure either. But I've always called it Sligo Salamander, I'm not quite sure why. But I then spent on and off the next 45 years researching Sligo Salamander and being told by the great and the good of Herzog for all I've researched that I was talking nonsense, there was no such thing and it was just a slightly abnormal coloured specimen, the cadaver of which could still be seen in the British Museum of Natural History, I kept on arguing the toss. And five years ago, Darren Nash phoned me up and told me, guess what, mate, they've discovered Sligo Salamander and they've said it exists. And it has been not only um, proved that it exists, but it has been um, referenced as having Boulanger being the first scientist to describe it. So I'm feeling quite pleased with myself because we discovered it. And it's one of the things that the CF said, have said that would happen, which actually did happen. And it's one in the eyes of the people who say cryptozoology is nonsense. It's a fantastic article, I know that, because I have just published an expanded version. It's a two-part article. I've put them together and published an expanded version of it in this year's yearbook, the 2024-2025 yearbook, which will be out probably by the time that you 
watch this show. And I also recommend this article because there's some really, really, really interesting things. Uh, stories of black alligators, which are probably salamanders of some sort in Canada. Fascinating, fascinating subject. And I'm really, really impressed with it. Just going back to the Hong Kong, to Sligo Salamander, I came across a letter in the South China Morning Post about a man who claims to have released several juvenile giant salamanders in the part of Hong Kong called the Peak, where John and I used to live. And I found out that there was a conduit leading from that part of Hong Kong to the botanical gardens where Sligo Salamander was found in the early 1920s. So the person who released these salamanders speculated that the one that turned up in the botanical gardens was one of the ones that he'd released uh, about 20 years earlier. Well, that's brilliant. The more information we can get on again to use the current vernacular the backstory of Sligo Salamander the better it will be and the happier I'll be. Yeah. My next article is by somebody I've heard of but I've had no contact with. Who's Kate Shaw? Kate Shaw has a blog or a podcast called Strange Animals? Yes. Uh, and I suppose you could call her a cryptozoologist, but she really covers anything, anything really unusual to do with animals. So she's on our wavelength, yeah. and she um, she's good. She's good at what she writes, yeah. And she's written here about killer kangaroos in 1934. Well, it turned out to be a hoax. That's... That's her take on the subject, is that it was made up by some newspaper journalists. Well, you I'm never afraid, know. Well, I'm afraid this happens, doesn't it? Yeah. I think one of the reasons that cryptozoology stories, which we take seriously, are plastered across the low, more lowbrow end of the British newspaper market is because they're stories which they believe are exciting enough to sell newspapers and obscure enough that nobody's going to try and work out if they're true or not. Yeah, I totally agree. Although it has to be said that there have been reports from different parts of the USA of mystery kangaroos, wallabies. So although this particular story from the 1930s quite possibly have been a hoax that does not explain the reports from the 1970s and later genuine of genuine mystery kangaroos